Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Before we dive into today's show, please smash the subscribe button so you can get notified instantly when our show comes out. Thank you, for you will not want to miss an episode of our true crime stories from around the world that will grab your interest from start to finish. Sit back, relax as Ava will bring you today's episode. Thank you, Eric. Today's episode of the True Crime Tales is the case of the Frog Boys of South Korea. It's about five little boys who wanted to spend their day off from school playing in the woods like they had so many times before. Only this time, they wouldn't come home. It's just after 1 p.m. when the phone rings at the home of Yu Jang Wu. He answers and he's surprised to hear someone from his son's Taekwondo Academy on the other end. This person tells him that 14-year-old Chuan didn't show up to his lesson today, which might have been more surprising on any other day. But today, March 26th, 1991, isn't any other day. You see, for the first time in 30 years, South Korea is holding local democratic elections. So, school's out, people are off work so they can vote. I mean, it's a big deal. And although Young Woo isn't all that happy that his son skipped practice, he's not exactly panicked, right? The whole family's routine is off, right? And he knows his son had gone out to play with four other boys. They're all kind of described as like the five musketeers. Their houses form the circle there in the village, and they're all super close. Our whole team tries hard to make it the best it can be. So, in this group of friends I mentioned at the top, you have Chuan, and he's the oldest at 14. Then there's Jojo Yen, who is 13, Kim Yongju, who's 12, Park Chung Ian, who's 11, and then Kim Jong Sik, who's 10. Now, if you're like me and you didn't already know this, the traditional South Korean age calculating system can be a bit confusing. The ages I read were displayed on a handout from the time, but today they might be aged differently. What's important is that they're all young, like preteen, teen kind of age. So, all that said, they're probably all together being little boys, losing track of time. So, Young Woo goes out searching for them. I mean, find one of them, you find all of them, that's what he's thinking, I am sure. But here's the problem, I mean, he's walking all over their village and he's finding none of them, not out playing, not at any of the other kids' houses. And one by one, the other parents start realizing that something's not right. I mean, not only is none of the boys home, but the other parents confirm that their kids never showed up to Taekwondo either. So, on the same mission now to locate their sons, these parents start asking around, and before long, they find someone who says that he had seen all the five boys earlier that day. According to an article for CNA Insider, this guy says that he had asked them where they were going, and the boys said that they were going up this nearby mountain to look for salamander eggs, which is honestly instant relief. Like, oh, that's where they are, makes sense, right? They aren't in the neighborhood because they're up on this mountain, yeah? And like, shame on them for skipping class, but they're probably all still up there. They're going to come home eventually. But as the afternoon turns to evening and it begins to get darker and darker, worry begins to creep back in. I mean, they're not worried that they might have gotten lost, but that they might have gotten hurt either coming or going from the mountain, because they know that there's a farm at the base of the mountain with some pretty aggressive dogs on the property. So, I think where their mind is going is like maybe one of those dogs got out, they hurt the boys. So, as the sun dips below the horizon, the group of parents heads up the mountain to look for their kids. But there is no sign of them anywhere, and this is when they really start getting panicked. The parents file missing persons reports with the local police, but the police aren't nearly as worried as they are. According to the article, In Search of the Frog Boys, which is the main source material for this episode, the police basically say they're probably just late getting home. They stayed out too late playing. It's not that big of a deal. But these parents' spidey senses are tingling. 
They know their kids wouldn't have just stayed out too late, and even if they did, they would have made their way home by now. So something must have happened. By the next day, the boys still weren't back, and this finally seems to make the police take things a little more seriously. They begin a search of the mountainous terrain with groups of officers, residents, even helicopters. They also conduct a search of the village itself, focusing on empty houses, arcades, you know, spots where kids could get snacks or places like that. But there's no sign of them anywhere. By the third day, the parents are beside themselves with worry, knowing that something must have happened to them. And just when they feel completely lost, the parents of Jiang Shik, the 10-year-old, get a call from someone who says, quote, I have the children. They are all suffering. Two are very ill now. The call isn't long. They're just instructed to get a lot of money and meet this mysterious caller on a specific street in the village. And even though I'm sure this sends fear coursing through them, it also gives them an answer to where their boys are and a bit of hope that maybe their kids are going to be returned to them. So, when the time comes, they head to this meeting spot, money in hand. So, did they tell the police about this, or are they just going rogue? Yes, the police are there too, like ready and waiting to confront whoever the caller is. But all of them, parents, police, everyone, just kept waiting and waiting. It's 20 minutes, 40 minutes, eventually a whole hour passes, and there's just nothing, no sign of a mystery man and no sign of their kids. So, was it a hoax, or did the cops being there have scared them? Well, in the end, they think that it was most likely just a hoax. So, over the next few days, Media outlets outside of the village get word about what's happening, and now that the election news has kind of died down, the public focus really turns to these missing boys, and their story finally becomes national news. They're dubbed the Frog Boys for, I think, just a flashy headline, because the news outlets reported early on that they had gone out to catch frogs, not like looking for salamander eggs like we heard early on, so somehow this nickname just stuck. But regardless of what they're called, the national attention is great. I mean, the parents even get to go on this live TV program called The Square of Public Opinions, where they talk about their kids and their frustrations with the police response, which, by the way, at this point, they were still frustrated with because despite outwardly seeming like police were finally taking the disappearances seriously, the parents actually explained on the program that it just doesn't seem like they actually care. I mean, for instance, they show a missing poster that the police have created, pointing out that the poster says runaway, not missing, which has a different connotation, exactly. These parents are more than frustrated, they're rightfully angry, and they know in their guts that their kids didn't just run away, so the assertion that they did just creates a further rift between the parents and the police. So much so that on this TV appearance, they're like, you know what, just contact us with your leads. There is even a phone line set up, and calls start coming in, one after another, like while they're doing this program. And then something wild happens. So again, literally while they're still on the air, the phone rings, and the person on the other end says that they are 10-year-old Zhang Shik. The voice on the other end sounds like a little boy, and he's crying for his mom. And Jiang Shiki's mother says it sounds like her son, but then the call gets cut off. The group managing the phones tries to call the number back, but they can't get him back on the line or whatever, and then they try and track where this call came from. Eventually, they do, but unfortunately, they find out that it was just another hoax. But despite that prank, the TV show keeps the missing boys in the national news, and there's a national effort to find the kids. Even the president of South Korea at the time even makes a statement and directs 300,000 police officers to search for the boys, not even just in their village. Hwang Sung Yoon reports for Korea Young Daily that as time goes on, searches also extend to reservoirs, bus stations, and terminals across the country. But even with all this effort, 
Weeks pass with no sign of the boys, and it makes the parents question if the search teams are even really searching. They get the feeling that the police are just out there because they must be, not because they care about finding the boys. And really, without any physical leads, rumors begin spreading about what could have happened to them. The biggest of which is that their disappearance has something to do with a nearby military base and a shooting range up the mountain. I think the rumor is that maybe somehow these kids had wandered to like the wrong place, gotten shot, and then it was all covered up by the military or someone within the military. And at first when this rumor starts, like the parents are skeptical because the shooting range is well marked, everyone knows about it, so it's unlikely that their kids would have just wandered in accidentally and gotten in the line of fire. It seems like something that wasn't a secret or anything. Exactly. The kids knew about it, but this rumor seems to hold water when they learn that someone had heard a gunshot on the day that the boys went missing. Apparently, according to the doc, one of 14-year-old Chuan's friends heard a shot, what sounded like a scream, and then just nothing. And this happened near the base, I assume. Well, that's the impression I get, or at least somewhere near the mountain. But nothing in the source material explicitly states that. But with all these rumors flying around about the military potentially being involved, you'd think that the police would investigate this idea. Especially with Chuan's friend's story about hearing the gunshot and the scream. But the police don't, and from the way it's presented in the documentary, I don't know if they even necessarily have authority to, though. Like, maybe only the military can investigate the military? Yeah, that's how it seems. Either that, or they don't think that there's enough stock in the military rumor to warrant an investigation. I can't totally tell. And just for some context, South Korea had been fluctuating between democracy and a dictatorship for decades before this, with the military having a lot of control and power. I'm not going to get into all the details here because we'd be here for hours, but even though the current president during all of this in 91 had been elected democratically, the country was still very much settling into the idea of democracy. So, considering the power that the military had in the past, and still does, it makes it difficult. I think it would make it difficult for the local police to investigate them. It doesn't make sense to me completely, though. Remember, there's only one shot and one scream. That doesn't take out five boys, five kids, yeah. I think the theory is that maybe there was an accident, and then one of the boys was killed, and then they killed the others. Potentially in another way too, like, A, cover it up or something. Again, it doesn't make total sense, or we don't have all the pieces, but it's just a theory. And then, since no one investigates the military to confirm this or shut it down, this theory just kind of lingers. It's just like out there still, right? So, since the police aren't really, like, getting answers, the parents feel like it's their job to do that. So, all the fathers of the boys kind of band together. They quit their jobs to go look for their kids full-time. They rent this truck. They outfit it with photos of their boys, like on the side of it, with the message, Please help find our missing children, printed below. And they drive this truck nationwide, searching for their kids, passing out flyers, raising awareness for their plight everywhere they go. And... Are the police doing anything at this point? They are. I mean, they're mostly doing searches, and they have cast a very wide net, searching areas, specifically with higher crime rates, fishing boats, even some religious organizations, which I think now might include organizations with religious affiliations like orphanages, even, for instance. It might be a good time to point out that our main source is the documentary. It was originally in Korean but subtitled in English, so it's possible that some of the translations were lost, but the translations could be vague. But anyway, even the sea and several islands outside of mainland Korea are searched. But really, I mean, again, even though they're far and wide, they're really, like, 
at least the police homing in on this area where the boys were last seen, and then, like, kind of scoping out a little bit from there. But it's the parents who are really getting all over this and them going out, the police still searching. This goes on for a year with no sign of the boys. But according to the doc, their parents do get support from the National Organization of Missing Children, which I think also might be a translation issue in the documentary because we can't find any record of this organization existing. There is something called the National Organization of Finding Missing Children and Family, which I think might be what they mean. Especially because one of the men interviewed in the documentary and credited as the chairman of the NOC is the head of the National Organization of Finding Missing Children and Family. Again, maybe it was named something different in the 90s, or was something different in the 90s isn't anymore, but if you go looking it up, you're going to get a dead end. But basically, I think it's like South Korea's version of Nick what we have National Center for Missing Exploited Children here in the U.S. But anyways, this organization that they get help with is especially like wonderful for them as they're doing media interviews. And it's good that they have this support because as they start doing more and more interviews, something weird happens about a year into the boy's disappearance. As they're doing all these interviews, they start spotting the same people at all of them, which I mean, on one hand, you could be like, oh, it's like reporters following this story. And that's what the chairman or head of this organization believes until he has a conversation with one of these guys. So, in the documentary, the chairman explains how he asks one of them who he works for, like not in an accusatory way, but like he is having a conversation, he's curious, yeah, and the man gives him a business card. But the business card doesn't have like a newspaper or even an organization name on it. It just has the man's name, a contact number, and the title of manager on it. Manager of what, right? It's strange, but you have to be hired as a manager and then manage things for something to have that title. It makes no sense, but like in that moment, the chairman, he doesn't press the matter, but it is with him enough that it makes this guy stick out even more. So, when he and others show up again and again and again, and when I say like they keep showing up, I'm not just talking about every interview, like he sees this guy on the street, he sees them where they're staying, like this guy is everywhere, like just around. It turns out that everyone's right to be suspicious because that guy who gave his card to the chairman works for an intelligence agency. How did they find that out? I don't know. That's like the big missing piece. There's like a gap of reporting or at least the stuff that we have access to, it feels like. Remember that Seinfeld episode where it's like, this guy's following them, yada yada yada, he's in, he's an intelligence agent? Oh, yeah. Like we like glazed over some pretty important parts here. Intelligence agency manager dude or whatever. Do we know why he's following them? So eventually they just like straight up ask the guy and the response that they get is that he's protecting the fathers. Protecting them from what? Well, that's the question, but I don't know if they get an answer to that one. And according to the documentary, none of the fathers feel all that protected. I mean... This is an intelligence agency, and I mean, this agency even sends people into their homes. Like, who sent these guys? The government? Has there been any threats made against the dads? Like, were they feeling in danger? I don't think so. And honestly, it seems like to one of the dads, specifically 11-year-old Johnny's father, and so he feels that it's more like these people aren't protecting them, but like looking into them, like they had something to do with this whole thing. Crazy, huh? But if that's what's happening, it doesn't seem like they found anything. But again, the reporting on this part, which I think is one of the most interesting parts of this, is sparse. Why can't I say for sure? And it seems like at some point the surveillance eventually just dies down. So we don't really have solid answers around why it happened, what they were looking for, or what they were protecting them from. It's just this, like, weird piece of the puzzle. Now, while that's going on, we're kind of wraps up like, meanwhile, 
the public still hasn't forgotten about the boys, and the attention seems to really culminate when a director approaches the parents and says that he wants to make a movie about the disappearance of their sons. And it seems like the parents are all for it, because they're kind of at the point where they'll just take any publicity now. The English translation of the movie is Come Back, Frog Boys, and it releases in 1992, but it doesn't end up being very successful at the time. Really, emotional movies aren't that popular in South Korea, so there's not a surge of interest or influx of tips. But the movie isn't the only form of media that features the boys. After it premieres, a singer contacts the parents, says that they want to write a song about them. Parents agree. Again, they're looking for any publicity they can get. But just like the movie, the song doesn't really generate any real movement for the case either. And same goes with a book that comes out shortly after the song. So, the fathers spend the next two years traveling the country, searching for any sign of their children or someone who might know what happened to them. And they're successful in keeping attention on the case for the most part, but eventually even that public interest fades. And by then, the fathers just can't keep going. I mean, they have funded pretty much this whole three-year trip on their own, and they have gone into debt that they can't ignore anymore. So as much as they want to keep searching for their kids, they must make the tough decision to go home, return to their jobs, and try to piece their lives back together with an important piece of each family still missing. It's a difficult thing that they do, but slowly, they start to scrape together some sense of structure. But that structure is shattered when the parents are contacted by none other than members of the military who want to meet them. The military personnel are from the base, they're on the mountain, and they ask to meet in person at night, specifically without letting the local police know. But if this is about the boys, like, I mean, they'll go anywhere, they'll do anything, no matter how sketchy. So, they agree, and they head up the mountain into the military base on the night they're told to go. And once they get there, they're led into this large tent where there are some soldiers waiting inside. I'm not sure how many people are there, but the documentary reports that one of them tells the parents that he can help them find their kids with the help of some supernatural powers that he can give them. He says that he can give one of them the power to locate where their kids are. And this is the military, right? Yes, this feels like it's turning into an episode of Supernatural. I was going to say, like this isn't some religious organization. They're on the military saying we have superpowers that we can dole out. And listen, you know what, not to turn this into a supernatural episode, but like I think the military, all militaries are working with some scary stuff. All I'm saying is like there's really saying that they have like this thing that they can dole out to civilians just to help them solve this. Yeah, I don't know if this is new because where was this three years ago? But, and why not give it to one of your soldiers to help find something like, does it have to be a family member? What are the rules of these supernatural powers? I have so many questions. Maybe it must be someone connected. All I know is if Josie was missing for three years and someone needed to like lay hands on me so I could find her, I would let them. I get it. It's exactly what happens one by one. This guy literally puts his hands on the sides of their heads and like I guess giving them the powers. And when this man gets to 12-year-old Young Ho's mom, she starts just speaking uncontrollably. Okay, like she's possessed, I guess. I don't know, whatever is happening. It seems to be what the soldier was looking for though because he tells the parents to just like let her talk, let her lead the way, follow her wherever she goes. And as she leaves the tent, they all exit the tent. She starts running up the mountain. Everyone's following close behind. But it's difficult to keep up. It's raining. It's muddy. They're trying to make it through the underbrush as safely as possible. But they manage to keep up. And eventually, finally, she stops and she just screams that their boys are here. And I don't know what those parents must have felt in that moment. Relief, fear, devastation. 
but whatever they felt must have quickly turned to confusion and then anger because their boys were not there. They're not anywhere nearby either. I mean, they do a search of this area that turns up nothing, not a body, not a scrap of clothing, nothing connected to the boys. So, what the heck was all of this for? I don't know. I haven't really seen an explanation of what happened. All I know is that once they all realize that their kids aren't there, the parents are scared. I mean, understandably fuming. Were the soldiers trying to be helpful? Were they just playing this massive joke on them? Like, I don't think it's a joke because it seems like something happened. I like I can't explain any of it. I don't even know if the parents even like went and reported this to police or if the military personnel face any consequences for doing this or if they were or if they did. It's kind of like the whole intelligence agency thing. It's just this another wrench that is thrown in the mix. But like I'm sure the family's feeling confused and frustrated. But if you thought that was wild, just wait, because in January of 1996, a man named Kim Kwan comes forward and says that he knows what happened to the boys. Kwan is a professor of psychology from the States, and according to the documentary, South Korea doesn't have many criminal psychologists in their country at the time, so his background gives him a lot of credibility. And he says he's been following and studying the case for a long time, and he says that he believes that 10-year-old Jiang Shiki's father is responsible for their disappearance. So, he claims that Jiang Shi's dad, whose name is Kim Cole Angio, apparently, he can't account for a few hours on the day that the boys went missing, which is true. When the police investigate the records they have from a few years ago, there is a period of three hours before the boy was found to be missing where he didn't tell them what he was doing. So, this raises some suspicion. Now, not with the parents. I mean, they don't think he could have done anything to hurt their kids, especially the fathers who, remember, they spent three years with this guy traveling the country together. So, they're all like, there's no way he did anything. But Quan is adamant that Cole Angio killed the boys and hid them somewhere. He says, likely somewhere in his house. Now, the media gets word about the accusation, and they just swarm the village. Chobi's house is searched specifically. They seem to be looking in the bathroom and in this back room. At first, it seems like they might have found something in the bathroom. Like, they say they find children's shoes. Like, five specific pairs of shoes that belong to the boys. Or just like a pair, because there's a big difference between those things. We can't find the details as to why this was so suspicious. All like literally all they say is they find children's shoes. But apparently it causes investigators to go to the extent of bringing in an excavator and they start digging up the floor of the bathroom. Then what I don't understand is how they weren't found before because then that means that they were just laying out in the open and we know that that mountain was searched by a lot of people for a long time. I know, and that's where I really get hung up is like how they had been out there this whole time without anyone finding them. Well, and on top of all that, the bullets tied up in their clothing again make it make sense with hypothermia. I think it all comes back to that very first theory where they're found is only about 300 meters, like 985 feet from that military shooting range, and the police tried to like explain away the bullet saying like, oh, yes, they were close to that area. They probably found some bullets. They were playing with the bullets, which is why they were found with their remains. I could maybe say that for like the spent cartridges, but the unused bullets. How did they get them? Well, if that's true, then were they by the shooting range? I go back to you. They weren't lost. They knew where the shooting range was. And on top of that, what about the hole in one of their heads? So, this is skipping ahead a little bit. It turns out that the holes are determined not to be from a gunshot wound, like there's no fracture of the bone. But like, reminder, they're saying this before the forensic team is done. So, again, at the time for them to be saying like, shouldn't you wait, like, a little bit? But listen, 
Even if one of them was accidentally shot, Huang Sunyun reports for the Korea Jungung Daily that there isn't any blood or anything on any of their clothes to indicate that. But again, like, they're doing this all so early. Do they even, like, fully realize that? I don't know what kind of tests they are doing. I have so many questions. The tests aren't done yet. The tests haven't even started yet. Listen, all that to say, even though they're presenting this serious fact, the parents are unconvinced. They say there is no way their kids just got lost and died of hypothermia. There is no doubt in their minds that their kids were murdered. And considering the bullets and the proximity to the shooting range, they are surer than ever that the military had something to do with their deaths. After all, their theory is made even more convincing when the military does come out and say, yes, those bullets were theirs, but they fully deny any involvement in the boys' deaths. Then how did a bunch of kids get access to the bullets? To your point, like not just the casings, like in used bullets, I don't know if they're saying that you just found them on the mountain, but to me, like, that's a little negligent. Those would be like, one base secured, checked out when you're like practicing at the range. They like even to try and offer an explanation, but there are even more questions because the forensic teams, once they get to do their jobs that they're paid to do, they find some evidence that the boys' deaths may not have been from natural causes. See, on some of the bones, specifically on the skull of 14-year-old Chuan, they find these marks that look to be from a blunt instrument. They're like these little indents, and some of the other bones have cuts in them too. Now, of course, police come out and say that those marks likely occurred post-mortem, but you know, just to be sure, the forensic team sends photos of the marks over to an anthropologist in the States for a second opinion. And the American anthropologist says that not only are those marks man-made, they happened before Chuan died. So, what made them? That's the question that they can't answer. There is one theory that the boys died of blunt force trauma, but they can't prove it, so they're at this kind of standoff with one another. And that's when the rescue team director for the Korea Alpine Federation gets word of the police's hypothermia theory, and he feels that something isn't right either. He states in the documentary that he goes to the mountain to look around, and based on his expertise, he doesn't think hypothermia tracks. For one, the boys weren't found super high on the mountain. Not only that, but they're less than 100 meters, we're talking a little over 300 feet from a road. So, they were lost right near a road on a mountain that they're familiar with. If you're cold enough to get hypothermia, they could have easily made it back to civilization. Even if it wasn't their village, they could have found someone to help them. And this Korea Alpine Federation guy also can't help but notice how close the boys are to the shooting range. And while they were technically outside of it, he knew that one of the guns that the military used was an M16, which can shoot far. The distance from the military base to where the remains were found is within effective range for an M16, but there would have been blood on their clothes if that had happened, right? That's true, but the parents think that's because or the lack of it is because only one of the boys got shot. So, their theory goes that the boys were out on the mountain near the shooting range, one of them was accidentally shot and killed, and in an order to cover it up, the military killed the other four via blunt force trauma. Why blunt force trauma if you shot one of them? Why dump them on the side of the mountain? I know there are a lot of times when force trauma doesn't result in any kind of bleeding. I'm still kind of surprised that if one of them was shot, we don't see any blood on anything, you know what I mean? Even just from I don't know. Well, and like had the clothes degraded, were they exposed to the elements at all? Like, there's just a lot of questions. Yeah, and what I imagine too, I imagine being five kids out there, you're literally playing, suddenly, your friend is shot. Oh, what would they do? I mean, do they all stay there and huddle? Do they run? Like, how did they even crawl? All the kids? I don't know. Like, if there's something about it that isn't right. I can't, there's a piece that I'm missing. 
If that's what happened and they killed the other boys because one was accidentally shot, did it all happen there on the side of the mountain? Like, how did they find out about it? If it was that far away. So, there's a tie to this military thing, and there's a bit of a caveat to this, something that might like, again, help tie it even more so. Remember how I said that the boys went missing on a national holiday? Yeah, it was like an election day. So, the military wasn't holding drills that day, so your everyday soldier wasn't shooting, but commissioned officers were permitted to use the shooting range at any time. And there's a rumor that circulates that this one officer went out that day with the intent to, like, use up some unspent bullets, although the name of that officer is unknown. And after all, it's just a rumor. It's not like the whole military was running drills and then this happened, and you have like the whole military go cover this up, it would have been like one person. You have one officer doing all of it. Yeah, so I don't know. Ultimately, the forensic team releases a report that states that the boys were killed and buried all in that same spot. They say all happened there, and they think this for a few reasons. One, because the bones that they excavated were all in anatomical order. So, how did they decompose first and then been buried where they were found? Their bones wouldn't have stayed all put together. But again, at the same time, if they would have been moved and buried while they were like, immediately after death, like, I think you would have seen the same thing. Immediately is also subjective. I mean, we said like a couple of days, even. But the other thing they point to is they say when a body decomposes, certain chemicals will seep into the soil around it, and even all these years later, the soil around them still contains these chemicals, indicating that this is where they decomposed. So it could be where they killed and put there, more than what they're saying is that they have decomposed there in that spot. So... They've essentially been there the whole time. Yeah, for a significant amount of that time. But like the National Organization of Missing Children, that guy, he gets hung up on the fact that no one found them during all those searches of the mountain when the boys first went missing. So, like, if you're saying everything points to the fact, they've been there the whole time. I know, like no one can prove anything. And what's worse, if the boys really were murdered, time is running out to find who killed them and charged them with the crime because the statute of limitations for murder there is just 15 years at the time. So, with that deadline creeping up, the race is on to find out what happened to these boys. Is anybody even in that race? Oh, police think it's hypothermia. They might have a theory, but they do go back and review all their old records from the time that the boys disappeared, looking for anything that they missed that could point to their killer or killers. But even in doing that, they don't find anything. So, then they just stop with their investigation, which to the parents just feels like they're giving up, and they don't want to rest until they know what happened to their kids. But with the forensic report out and the police not willing to do more, there's only so much that they can do. By 2004, the parents make the decision to finally lay their children to rest. They are each cremated, and on March 26, 2004, exactly 13 years after they went missing, their ashes are scattered in a nearby river. When the parents felt that it was only right to release their ashes together because they were inseparable in life, and hopefully they can find peace together in death. Now, over the years, the parents have tried to keep the fight going for their kids. There was a lawsuit that was filed against the police, which ended up going to trial, like three trials, all of which ended with the judge siding with the police. There is a win in 2007 when the statute of limitations for murder was raised from 15 to 25 years, and then in 2015, it's removed entirely, which is great. Like, if they ever find out who murdered them now, they can do something about it. But by 2015, and even to this day, 2024, there haven't been any updates. The idea that the military was involved is still the consensus among the parents and the public. 
But unless someone comes forward with new information, the deaths of Chuan, Ho, Yen, Yang, Gu, Chan, and Zheng, Sheik will remain shrouded in mystery. Thank you Ava for another interesting show, as always. Thanks for joining us and hope that you enjoyed our latest podcast. Please follow us on the links in our channel page. And leave a review, please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel also hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time, we reveal a new shocking case. Thanks again and see you here next time.